Let me introduce Professor Alphate. Um, he will talk on these issues and uh, then we proceed with the lecture. So Professor Alphate is an emeritus professor from Otto Suhr Institute uh, at uh, Freie Universität Berlin. Um, he, ha he is the author of uh, numerous uh, uh, highly cited books such as The Limits of Globalization or The End of Capitalism as We Know It and has more recently written on uh, the issue of the Anthropocene also. Um, but he has also been uh, working at developing a radical political economy of, uh, of the environment uh, and uh, has been doing so for a long time, uh, especially in the German context. Uh, and aside from his academic career, he has uh, devoted a lot of time to activism as well. For example, as an academic advisor of uh, Attack, uh, which is uh, an activist platform uh, all over, uh, working all over the world, uh, now currently against uh, austerity measures and uh, has been the contributor to radical uh, journals such as Procla, which uh, politicize, um, uh, amongst other issues, the ecology. Um, so, without further ado, I would like to pass over to you uh, and we'll enjoy the lecture with a Q&A afterwards. Many thanks for the kind invitation to this uh, lecture and to participate in your uh, network, although it's only marginal participation. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm very interested in that, what you are doing, not at least, because I know, of course, uh, some of uh, the members of this network, of the, the uh, senior members of that network. Well, the topic of uh, this lecture this afternoon is academia and then you said alternatives and activism and I will change uh, the title a little bit and say academia activism uh, alternatives and activism and then strategies for politicizing ecology in precarious uh, times whatever precarious times are uh, I first, before I start with my uh, PowerPoint uh, uh, um, 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 pictures, I have to apologize for my English. Uh, since I am uh, an emeritus or uh, a professor in uh, in the so-called, in German, Ruhestand. That is, uh, he is no more active at the university. Uh, I uh, have uh, not spoken English since uh, a long time, and therefore it is difficult for me to change, uh, to switch quickly and without any difficulties into this language. But uh, I also know that uh, some of you, or many of you, perhaps the majority of you, are not uh, English-speaking, uh, originally English-speaking persons, uh, so that you know these problems which I have, and you will be polite enough as uh, to forget it. And uh, secondly, this was also a reason uh, because I know the problem, this was also the reason why I prepared uh, a PowerPoint uh, session in order to facilitate uh, the uh, following of uh, the ideas of the argumentation of uh, my lecture on, as I said, academia, activism and alternatives, uh, strategies for politicizing ecology in precarious uh, times. The first the first uh, exhi exhibit uh, shows once again uh, the uh, lecture and its uh, disposition, uh, the plan of the lecture. I begin, of course, with uh, this triple A and the first A of the triple A. Triple A, you know, is a very good or the best uh, note of uh, rating agencies and uh, so I'm very grateful for those who 
formulated uh, the title uh, that they use this triple A. And the first A is uh, academia, and we have to deal with theoretical approaches, with analysis, diagnosis, and perhaps also therapy. And then the second A stands for alternatives, and the third A stands for activism, for action, for collective and perhaps also individual action. The first triple A of the first A of the triple A uh, means that we have to deal with theoretical approaches uh, to the problems of politicizing the ecology. We first have to understand what is the ecology in our understanding, and we have to deal with the ecology uh, because of uh, the great transformation, you know the term of uh, Karl Polanyi uh, probably very uh, well, uh, to a capitalist market economy in the late 18th and early 19th century. Uh, the concept of Polanyi and also the concept of uh, Karl Marx, who also spoke about this great transformation without calling it a great transformation, but uh, calling it uh, the original accumulation of capital and then, then uh, the accumulation process uh, of capital as a, historic, a new historical dynamic in human uh, history. But what is the great transformation? In the understanding of Karl Polanyi, it is uh, the disembedding of uh, the market uh, from society. And we have to add today, uh, and Polanyi did not mention it uh, explicitly, but he spoke a lot about the process which I am uh, presenting here, uh, and that is the uh, disembedding from society and from nature. And then the return of uh, these uh, uh, disembedded uh, uh, environments of uh, the market economy as uh, external factors, as so-called in German Sachzwänge, Sachzwang. That is an external uh, factor which is uh, exerting force on the social actors in a disembedded market economy. So the transformation of nature and labor power into commodities is the most outspoken and most important part of uh, this process. It is that what uh, Marx called the original uh, accumulation uh, process, and that is uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, emergence of uh, the class structure of the capitalist society and that is of the contradiction, the class conflict, and the contradiction between capital and uh, labor. And that is uh, the process in which the capitalist social formation is uh, born. And uh, we have to take into consideration that now labor, as well as capital, as well as uh, other products of labor, are becoming commodities which are traded on the market and they have to obey uh, to the market forces and the market rules. And that is also true for money, uh, because money on the one hand is a mediator of all these market processes, but on the other hand money is also a commodity which is traded on markets, on money markets, on capital markets, on markets uh, for bonds and securities, uh, and uh, on financial markets. And what this means we are experiencing today, uh, for instance, um, with regard uh, to the financial crisis, uh, the global financial crisis, which is not over, which began perhaps 2007, 2008, but is not over today, or the euro crisis, uh, which we are facing in our uh, continent. That is the first um, a, uh, or the, 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 the starting of the first A, uh, we have to deal with the emergence of a capitalist social formation, which is our present today. But we have to take into consideration, and that is very important for ecological uh, analysis, we have also to deal with the, with the problem 
or whose effect, it's not a problem, whose effect that before the great transformation to a capitalist market economy, a pre-fossil capitalism already existed. Uh, I have uh, to, to add that uh, the disembedded market economy is a very dynamic uh, social form formation, but it is only dynamic because the energy it uses is it's a very powerful one. And uh, the energy used above all in a market economy uh, of our times is uh, fossil energy, coal first, then oil and uh, gas, and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, we have to be aware, uh, because that is important for ecological, ecological questions uh, today, uh, that there existed already a pre-fossil uh, capitalism. Pre-fossil uh, capitalism, for instance, uh, in England since the 16th or perhaps already 15th century, or in Italy in the city republics, uh, in Italy since the 12th or 13th uh, century, that was a capitalism. And uh, many of uh, the institutions of a capitalist society and uh, the, of the instruments of uh, capital uh, circulation, uh, especially in the banking industry, have been invented uh, in Venice, in Milano, in uh, uh, other Italian uh, cities that was capitalism, but it was a pre-fossil uh, capitalism. And uh, after and the fossil capitalism only came into existence at the end, or in the second half, let me say, of the 18th uh, century. That was, the, uh, uh, that was the emergence of uh, capitalism which uh, is following uh, the rules of, uh, and I use uh, the differentiation that is, uh, uh, of, uh, of Karl Marx, which is uh, fully using uh, the exploitative uh, power of capital uh, with regard uh, of uh, labor. It is the so-called real uh, subsumption of uh, labor under capital and today we have to add that this subsumption is also that of nature, real subsumption under uh, the rule of capital. But in, uh, in, in contrast uh, to that real subsumption, there was before a so-called formal subsum subsumption of uh, labor and of nature under capital. That is, uh, it was the same way of exploiting labor and nature as it was ever before. Uh, but now under the rule of capital, but then capital itself uh, tried to change the conditions of producing surplus value uh, to uh, reformulate the conditions of exploitations uh, in the sense of capitalist uh, accumulation. That, is, uh, that took place in the 18th century, but formal subsumption under uh, capital existed already before this period, that is since the 16th or even earlier uh, centuries. And uh, uh, Marx also give, uh, gives another uh, differentiation between these uh, different uh, phases of development, and uh, that is uh, the uh, absolute versus uh, relative surplus value uh, production. Uh, perhaps those who are a little bit familiar with the capital of Marx know this differentiation between absolute and uh, relative uh, production of uh, surplus value. The one exploitation of production of surplus value is uh, following the, in, uh, the uh, uh, integration of always more living labor in quantitative terms uh, into the circuits of uh, capital. And the other, uh, the relative surplus value production, is changing the rules of uh, the game. And that means that productivity is increasing in order uh, to produce uh, a growing uh, mass of uh, surplus value or of, of products 
which incorporate uh, surplus uh, value. This is important to know because of uh, two reasons. One reason is the following one. In, uh, uh, in the history of uh, the ecological hist uh, history of uh, the capitalist world system, there is a distinction uh, between uh, the um, fossil era and the pre-fossil era. Uh, that is also a case for uh, the differentiation of eras of uh, the geological formation of our planet Earth. Uh, we know all the differentiation between the Holocene, which began more or less uh, 10,000 years ago, and uh, then the uh, transition from the solar energy as a basis of the, the energetic basis of the Holocene uh, to the use of fossil energies at the end of the 18th century when another geological era uh, began. The old Holocene was over and another era began uh, which uh, up to a couple of years ago had no name but today it has a name and that is the name Anthropocene uh, which has been introduced by geologists and climate uh, scientists and uh, many other natural scientists, not so much uh, by social scientists, uh, but uh, in the meanwhile also social scientists accept this term Anthropocene in order to make this uh, distinction between the times from the Neolithic Revolution 10,000 years ago to the fossil revolution in the 18th century. But this uh, differentiation of uh, Marx and, and others is a little bit different from that which I already uh, made because it says that there was a period in the so-called Holocene uh, to the capitalist uh, system, but capitalism as a fossil energy using system only came into existence at the end of the 18th century but capitalism as a social formation existed before, since the 13th or 14th century in Italy and since the 16th century in, uh, in England and since the 18th, 19th century also in other countries of uh, continental uh, Europe. So we have to make different uh, distinctions in order to understand what happened during the long history of uh, mankind. And that is not only um, play with uh, no importance, uh, only for fun. It is, it is important. It is important because uh, I showed it last sentence on the exhibit, uh, because it means logically at least if there existed a pre-fossil capitalism, then logically it's also poss uh, possible that there will come a post-fossil capitalism. It might be that it is another social formation linked to the post-fossil social system, socialism, as we called it in the 20th century, or something else, a solar society, uh, some people uh, call it. Non-COVID capitalist solar uh, society is possible, but also a post-fossil capitalism is possible that depends on social action insofar the uh, social activities mentioned in the title of this lecture are really of, uh, uh, of importance. And we have to uh, make our history ourselves and then decide what kind of uh, society uh, we want. Uh, capitalist society or post-fossil uh, characteristics or another society which is also post-fossil post uh, but no more a capitalist one. But that is up to you to discuss this problem uh, further on. The social formation of modern capitalism comes on uh, at the end of the Holocene and the transition uh, to uh, the uh, uh, fossil and industrial capitalist uh, society. 
and that has uh, extreme consequences. I mention them because some of them are very well known and, uh, for you and you are familiar with the problems. That is first the quantitative dimension. Uh, the quantitative dimension, that means uh, growing uh, or increasing growth rates of, uh, of the economy. Uh, and you have to take into consideration uh, what happens before. I use always uh, this uh, graph, which is based on the numbers uh, of uh, uh, Angus Madison, a Norwegian statistician, who, um, who published uh, 2000 uh, a millennial study, as it has, or a millennial uh, report, as it has been uh, called, about uh, the economic performance of uh, the world economy and of parts of the world economy, of regions of, of single uh, countries. Uh, since the year zero until our present, uh, the present that was 1998, that is uh, the uh, end of the 20th century. And uh, you see very clearly that in uh, the whole history, the last 2000 years, and it was not so different, but there are no numbers. Uh, the millennia before, there was no growth in the economy, or only little growth. Um, and then the growth rates exploded at the end of the 18th century, all over the world. And uh, uh, that is what is quite new. And since then, we have a problem with growth. Before, there was no problem with growth. And we are uh, bound to the uh, growth uh, economy and uh, to the consequences which uh, growth bears. And uh, you are very familiar with that. Um, well, in the quantitative sense, growth comes up. And uh, what is not existed, what not was present uh, before. And uh, uh, then uh, we have also a qualitative aspect of this de development. And we have to deal with the problem that growth is also accumulation of capital. So when we speak about growth and when we are criticizing uh, the growth economy, then we have to be aware uh, that uh, taking this qualitative aspect into account that we have to deal with capitalist accumulation and that we have to interpret growth and critique of growth in terms of a critique of the social formation of uh, capitalism. Um, it is uh, very far-reaching what is uh, happening since the, end, uh, since the uh, second half of the 18th century. A new rationality comes in. That is the birth, not by accident, of uh, political economy. Uh, the Smithian uh, this is a book about the wealth of nations uh, of Adam Smith. It has been published in uh, 1776 first publication that is also at the end of the 18th century. Uh, it is very, very interesting and a little bit amusing uh, that Adam Smith taught and worked at the same university in Glasgow uh, as uh, other scientists, James Watt, for instance, but they didn't know from each other. Cooperation beyond the limits of natural science and, uh, and social science was not uh, evident and was uh, not there. And so far, it was not so different from our times today. We also have problems of cooperation between natural and uh, social uh, scientists. So they didn't know from each other. In the times when uh, James Watt already discovered uh, the moving power of, uh, of vapor, uh, Adam Smith only thought in uh, terms of, of producing uh, heat for workers in the, factory, in the cold factories uh, by burning uh, coal, not by using coal as a method, as an energy factor in order uh, to increase the productivity 
of uh, labor. His idea of increasing productivity of labor was only division of uh, labor. And you know very well the example which uh, Adam Smith uh, gave for the increase of productivity. It was not the use of uh, fossil energy. That was what James Watt uh, did and what he was uh, doing research over at the same University of Glasgow. Uh, that is uh, an example which uh, you find in the book of, uh, of uh, Ilya Prigozhin and Isabel Stengers about the dialogue uh, with nature. Uh, this is a very interesting example for the limitedness of uh, scientific work. Well, uh, the disembedded market, and that is uh, what we have to be aware of, uh, the disembedded market uh, is uh, a consequence of uh, these developments, uh, but uh, the disembedded market is not a harmless uh, pattern, as uh, Karl Polanyi says, uh, but it is becoming a social monstrosity, as he called it uh, in his book about the Great uh, Transformation. Well, in order to sum up a little bit, uh, fossil energy plus occidental technical rationality, therefore uh, the new role of uh, natural sciences also, the exploitation of uh, labor, and therefore you need also social sciences, you need also uh, microeconomics and all that, plus money commodification uh, of products, disembedded markets and uh, exploited uh, labor. That is what um, is now uh, the entity, the totality of uh, the capitalist uh, system. And they are coming up uh, in the decades uh, to come. Uh, natural limits, we know it from literature, peak oil, peak everything, climate crisis, crisis of modernity, of Fordism, and so on and uh, so forth. Well, as you have already seen this, uh, this graph, um, and I already mentioned that the history of uh, high growth rates is a very new uh, history, and uh, that it has also consequences uh, for the development of the capitalist world system. Uh, because on the one hand, growth, W, Y, uh, as I mentioned there in this exhibit, uh, is uh, the uh, combination of uh, the increase of uh, labor in quantitative terms, that is uh, the volume of labor uh, employed by capital, on the one hand, and then the increase of productivity, that is the gross national income or gross domestic product uh, per single worker or working hour. That depends how you go uh, to measure uh, it. And uh, so long as growth is mostly dependent on uh, labor time, uh, it is important that you have uh, food, enough food, for a growing number of workers integrated into the production process. That is one of the aspects or one of the preconditions of the uh, growth and accumulation of capital, which are mentioned by, for instance, by Jason Moore, uh, who will come to, to give a talk here, as I, as I heard, and who will be here in Berlin uh, to give a talk uh, on the 18th of June in the Rosa Luxemburg uh, Foundation, which you simply find in the, in the internet. And uh, Jason Moore mentioned four cheats as the precondition for the development of uh, capitalist, uh, capitalism in recent times and uh, responsible for the dynamics of uh, the capitalist system. And the first uh, of these cheaps is food. 
and food is absolutely important insofar as absolute surplus value production is predominant because it depends on always more workers integrated into the production process and these workers need food. That is one of the species of uh, Jason Moore and of course this is the same what uh, David Ricardo uh, says in his book of uh, 1817 when he mentions uh, the necessity of uh, opening the limits of or the borders of a national uh, system in order to import uh, goods. And that is the reason for his famous theorem on the comparative uh, cost advantages. Uh, but why shall we open uh, the uh, borders in order to, uh, to, 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 to have uh, these uh, uh, advantages? Uh, because we have to uh, make uh, wage goods cheaper in order to increase the profits. All is in order to increase profits, explicitly said by David Ricardo. It is not my interpretation, it is what David Ricardo uh, said. And uh, the four cheaps, the first of these four cheaps, uh, cheap food for more labor is one of the most important factors to increase uh, the growth rate by integrating ever more workers into the capitalist production process. But then productivity uh, becomes one of the factors of, uh, of, 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 of growth and of accumulation and that means uh, that you need machinery and in order to build machinery you need raw materials and you need raw materials as cheap as possible and you need for these machines uh, energy uh, to drive the machinery and uh, you can use biotic energy first it was done uh, so you need uh, windmills wind energy uh, you need water mills uh, water energy uh, you need uh, animal energy for horses, of cows and so on and so forth. And then you use uh, fossil energy because fossil energy is much more powerful uh, than biotic energy and uh, uh, other uh, yeah, biotic energy uh, or renewable energy uh, can be. So uh, the, not only food must be cheap, now also raw materials must be cheap and energy must be cheap and uh, as a result also labor is becoming cheaper than it was uh, before. So you have four cheaps which are the basis for the development for the, the, the uh, fast uh, development of the capitalist uh, system. That is what uh, Jason Moore says and which is uh, very simply uh, to, uh, to understand. Well, uh, this is uh, once again the idea uh, that it is food production in agriculture, uh, that this makes possible an increase of uh, labor to be integrated into the capitalist production uh, process. Uh, you need the industrial revolution based on fossil energy in order to increase labor productivity and that results in an increase of the growth rate of uh, GDP which has been enormous uh, since the end of the 18th uh, century. But then we have to take into consideration what really happened uh, in this uh, great transformation. One of the most important aspects is the following one. Uh, f formerly in energy systems before uh, the fossil uh, revolution, before the fossil and industrial revolution, uh, the energy uh, system was based on solar energy, on the solar rays which have been used by uh, since the Neolithic uh, revolution for sedimentary, stationary agriculture. Uh, before that, uh, mankind, as well as other animals, 
uh, lived uh, from hunting and gathering the fruits which are growing in, in, in wild uh, nature. And now, after the Neolithic Revolution, it was a systematic use of solar rays in order uh, to transform this energy into that what we want, into fruits and animals and so on and so forth. Uh, but then the system changed again with the fossil and industrial revolution at the end of the 18th century when it was fossil energy which were, became the most important and main uh, driver of uh, the economic and social and also political uh, system. Uh, but that has one characteristic which is important to understand because it makes the problems, most of the ecological problems which we are, fa which we are facing uh, today. And that is uh, that uh, the inputs of our production system uh, stem nearly completely uh, from earth, uh, from the crust of the earth, and uh, also the outputs of our system, uh, uh, of our production system, are, uh, are deposited in the spheres of planet Earth. The emissions, the gasic emissions in the atmosphere, the liquid emissions in the oceans and the rivers, and uh, the solid emissions uh, in the terrestrial grounds of uh, the Earth or in the lithosphere. Uh, so all spheres are, uh, are uh, loaded with uh, emissions which have a negative effect, as we know, on the ecological stability of uh, the uh, uh, spheres of our planet Earth. That is a problem resulting uh, from closing the energy system uh, against the solar rays and uh, by using the fossil energy which we find in the crust of planet Earth. In order to understand uh, the consequences of uh, um, this planetary trajectory, trajectory from an energetically open to an energetically closed system uh, one has to take into consideration uh, one of the uh, crucial categories in the Marxian uh, theory, and that is the double character of uh, human labor, of human products, of, we can say, all economic uh, uh, processes. Because this double co character allows to distinguish and to bring it together as parts of a totality, uh, it allows to, dis to distinguish between the ecological transformations in uh, nature uh, by producing uh, use values, useful products for the satisfaction of our lives. That is what uh, Nicolas Georgescu Rögen, one of the most prominent ecological economists, as you know, uh, said. Uh, when he developed uh, the uh, entropy uh, increasing activities of human being, he asked himself uh, in his most important book of 1971, uh, he asked himself, why do people do that stupid things to increase entropy uh, instead of uh, doing better things. And uh, he answered, yes, we do that uh, because of the enjoyment of life. We want to satisfy our, uh, our needs and uh, by satisfying the need, uh, in order to satisfy the needs we have to produce. And when we are producing, we uh, inevitably uh, increase the uh, entropy of the whole system of our planetary system and at the end of the day uh, we have planetary ecological problems and we don't know how to resolve them. That is uh, the consequence of that. Well, 
And due to the double character, we have also to distinguish between uh, different uh, measures uh, of uh, these uh, changes on, in a double, double uh, sense. On the value side, the economic sphere, uh, we have one measure which is the most important one, although it, uh, it, uh, it appears in different uh, uh, forms. It is a profit rate. It's a profit rate which always shows uh, the result of a process uh, and uh, the inputs necessary to produce these results. And we try to increase the profit rate or the rentability, as it's called, or the, uh, the uh, 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 in, in Keynesian uh, terms, uh, it, it, it is uh, the um, uh, uh, it, is, it has different, different names uh, for the same uh, relation between the result and uh, the input in order to achieve this uh, result. And secondly, we have uh, another measure, and that is the energy return on energy invested, the ROA, which is used by energy scientists, by, uh, by uh, uh, technicians and so on and uh, so forth, because it is important to know how much energy uh, must, be, uh, uh, must be used in order to produce a certain amount of uh, new energy. And Joseph Gröggen um, said, yes, look to the Neolithic revolution. It was very simple uh, to have uh, a piece of, of wood set into fire by accident. Uh, uh, for instance, in, in nature during a storm, and then uh, a whole wood is uh, burning, uh, and uh, then the ash is a wonderful uh, method in order uh, to make uh, fruitful land. It is very, very few energy invested in order to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to produce a lot more of energy useful for uh, human beings and perhaps also uh, for other uh, beings. That is uh, a very high energy return on energy uh, invested. And uh, uh, we can use this uh, relation uh, for many other processes uh, in our, uh, in our uh, world. Um, and therefore, we can also understand uh, the fossil appetite in uh, modern times since the 18th century. What are the advantages of fossil energy? Uh, compared to other energies. They have a very high uh, energy return on energy invested. That's the first point. And the second is uh, that fossil energy and the use of fossil energy is independent on time and space. Uh, you can use this ev everywhere. You can transport fossil energy very simply from one place uh, to another uh, place. And uh, you can uh, you, you can use it today or you use it uh, tomorrow. You can store it also rather uh, simply. Much more simply uh, is in uh, solar energy. You can store uh, coal and a, and a barrel of, of oil uh, from today until uh, 10 years later. You can store in the same way uh, solar energy. That is a great advantage of, uh, uh, of uh, fossil energy, also important now for energy, uh, for, for political uh, questions uh, around the use of energy and the introduction of, of renewable uh, energies, which you are, I think, very familiar uh, with. And um, then is, uh, is, there is a third advantage, which is not unimportant, because uh, fossil energy uh, serves exclusively the capital. Uh, fossil energy reserves can be transferred totally into private uh, property and thus into a stock of capital. That is not possible with solar energy. There's a great advantage. 
And you find it, for instance, in uh, such ridiculous developments uh, like uh, the uh, like the the the, the uh, uh, overestimation of uh, reserves uh, by uh, Shell, for instance, and the correction of this overestimated reserve because uh, the higher reserves in the in the uh, in the balance of uh, the Shell company means that uh, there is much more capital in uh, the Shell company, and that the value on, on the stock exchange market is uh, increasing. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, not geologists uh, show that uh, the reserves are uh, lower than de declared by Shell, uh, but the, the American Federal Reserve declared uh, Shell as, uh, as a a fraudulent uh, company because it has uh, uh, upgraded uh, their uh, fossil reserves in a, in a manner and uh, in a way that is not uh, possible and not allowed. Well, uh, the advantage of fossil energy, therefore, is uh, first in independence on space and time, uh, secondly, uh, it is exclusively uh, uh, for capital because they can be transferred into uh, reserves. And uh, thirdly, uh, the biotic rhythms are more and less, more and more unimportant in comparison to the rhythms of uh, capital uh, development. So the Consequences uh, are an increase of uh, the growth rate, but in the social form of capital accumulation. We have always to be aware on that. Here you find some numbers on the so-called ROA, which uh, come from a book by, uh, by Heinberg, who is one of uh, the most important um, uh, ecologists in, in Canada. And uh, energy invested is one in the case of crude oil and uh, the energy uh, uh, which is the result of this investment is 19 times higher. And uh, therefore it shows very well uh, the importance of uh, fossil energy for the development of uh, capitalism. And to take into account and be aware uh, that uh, the uh, relation of uh, energy uh, invested to energy return. It's the same relation in, uh, in, formal, in a formal sense than the relation between uh, profits and the costs to produce that uh, profit. It is European rationality which is uh, virulent in both areas of this double characterized uh, process. But we have to be aware uh, that all these processes are taking place into a social formation and that the increase of uh, economic uh, growth uh, turns into a fetishism of uh, growth. An exaggeration which is uh, very well known and uh, very uh, important and for ecologists one of the points of critique of the capitalist uh, system. And the fetishism of growth is very clear, for instance, um, today. First, um, in Germany, we have a Wachstumsbeschleunigungsgesetz, a growth acceleration uh, law, as if it was, would be possible to, to declare or to, to, uh, to uh, increase growth rates by law. Uh, but it's not only Germany which makes this nonsense, uh, but also in Brazil, um, done by a left government, uh, uh, was the same, uh, it um, happened the same. Uh, they uh, have developed or established uh, two f in the year 2011, uh, I guess, uh, a pact, a social pact on the acceleration of, uh, of growth. It was a Lula uh, government uh, who made this uh, pact for 
uh, the acceleration, not only for growth, but for the acceleration uh, of growth, as in Germany. So uh, that is uh, the first um, example for this fetishism. The second is uh, a World Bank declaration, growth is good for the poor. Uh, the poor are the result of non-growth or low growth and increased growth, uh, then you uh, are abolishing poverty in uh, society. It is nonsense. I could say a lot about that, but uh, I will leave it aside because we have also to see uh, that uh, only in a growing economy uh, jobs are created. Also, that is one of the fetishized uh, sayings in uh, this de debate and uh, nobody uh, takes into consideration that growth is a consequence of investments and investments can be job creating investments, yes, uh, but also uh, jobs uh, 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 reducing investment, investment of rationalization for instance, uh, they are reducing the number of jobs and not increasing them. But in the public debate, uh, you never hear that. You always hear, yes, growth is good uh, for the jobs. Trade unions say that and corporations, companies say that. Uh, the politicians uh, say that uh, from uh, green parties uh, to the conservative parties, there is nearly no uh, different difference at, at all. And growth is also important uh, for the for uh, to come out of the debt crisis. Uh, that is what uh, uh, is said to the indebted uh, euro countries today, to Greece and, uh, and Portugal and so on. Uh, curb uh, growth in order uh, to uh, to come out of uh, the debt debacle. Well. And uh, the growth rate also, and that is the, the peak of uh, fetishism, uh, the growth is also a measure, a benchmark uh, for the performance uh, of a given country. And what happens in the course of economic growth? I only mention two aspects. The first is the cyclical aspect, and uh, we would have to deal with the cyclical a crisis uh, in the growth or accumulation uh, process of capital, which is a well-known discourse uh, in a traditional uh, critical um, economic uh, theory in Marxism as well as in Keynesianism. But uh, the other problem, which is more important for our discourse, are the cumulative effects of, uh, of growth. On the one hand, economic cumulative effects and that is concentration and centralization of uh, capital, the growth of the companies and so on and so uh, forth and uh, the accumulation of immaterial uh, capital of uh, knowledge, information, etc. and so on. Uh, and it is absolutely clear uh, that these cumulative uh, processes are uneven <coughs> and unequal in the world, in each country as well as in the world uh, in uh, total in totality. And that means that uh, in the course of capitalist growth, it is uh, unavoidable, it inevitable that uh, inequality is increasing. And now we would have to deal with the Piketty uh, debate, uh, for instance, uh, uh, his book, uh, some of you perhaps have read it, uh, The Capital in the 21st Century, uh, that is showing how inequality is uh, an outcome of the capitalist uh, dynamics and that we have to fight it uh, by uh, increasing uh, the public sector and uh, the um, uh, tax on uh, capital in order to avoid, in order to avoid uh, these uh, cumulative effects which are so conflict-loaden uh, that we have to find some solutions for the problem. But of course it is uh, in our context even more important that these cumulative effects also exist in nature. Uh, 
uh, due to the transformations of matter and uh, energy. Entropy increased, that has been already uh, mentioned. Uh, unless um, new energy is imported in order to compensate uh, for uh, the increase of entropy. That is always uh, uh, possible, uh, but it is practically not realizable. Uh, that is a big problem uh, because we are not, in, in not able uh, to use the energy of the sun in order to compensate for the increase of entropy. Uh, or we have not found the solution for the problem. Perhaps we are optimistic enough to say there is a solution, at least. We did not find it until now, but we can find it. Uh, but uh, it is uh, also a good, um, a good uh, uh, interpretation that it is impossible to find such a solution due to uh, natural uh, laws. Well, uh, the cumulative effects in the economic system uh, in the uh, <coughs> of the economic system have their repercussions in the uh, ecological world system. And uh, that is one of the reasons also why we have to analyze not only the world economy and the world economic system, uh, the, like Wallerstein and others, but also to take into account that we have to deal with the world ecological uh, system and uh, that uh, this uh, world ecological system has a certain uh, trajectory of its development, which I only mention here. But uh, the cumulative effects also uh, also have as a consequence that uh, the development, the accumulation process, the growth process is reaching uh, certain uh, limits and transgressing uh, these uh, limits. Uh, for instance, I, I mention here uh, rather famous, and uh, perhaps some of you have already seen this uh, wonderful uh, exhibit, uh, some of the uh, limits of uh, the world system, the world ecological system, already are reached or transgressed. The limits of the climate system, uh, the extinction of species and uh, the laws of evolution of uh, species, and then the nitrogen uh, cycle. These are limits which already are reached. Others are not reached, or we know not enough about it, uh, but we have to be very, uh, very uh, aware of uh, the dangers uh, in which the mankind is, uh, is going by following or by continuing uh, the accumulation uh, path as in the past. Uh, and that is uh, why uh, Naomi Klein, in her in famous book, This Changes Everything, Capitalism's, Capitalism versus Climate, uh, concludes in order to save the climate, it is necessary to fight capitalism. So there is a reversal of the interpretation of uh, the collapse uh, in uh, the last century, when everybody or the left people already said the collapse of capitalism is uh, possible, it is an economic and political and social uh, collapse, uh, perhaps as a result of class struggle or even not as a result of class struggle in the theory of, of, uh, of, of Grossman, for instance. And now it is very clear uh, that uh, it is uh, the climate with, and other natural uh, systems which are threatened by a, a collapse and uh, that due to the double character uh, we have to deal with capitalism and fight capitalism in order to prevent this kind of uh, collapse. Well, uh, we could uh, use a lot more of information on uh, this coming possible uh, collapse I have uh, some of the, uh, of the 
of, uh, of the, the, the impact uh, dynamics. Um, but the consequence is that we have uh, to take into account, into account that uh, human beings in the meanwhile make planetary history and uh, therefore it is uh, perhaps justified to call the new era after the industrial revolution of the 18th century the Anthropocene. And that is what many geologists and climate scientists, natural scientists in general uh, do. And there's a broad debate internationally on the Anthropocene. But we have to take into account also uh, that humans make history in a well-defined social formation, uh, in the capitalist social formation, and uh, therefore uh, perhaps it is justified not to call it Anthropocene without mentioning uh, that it is uh, capitalism in which uh, men, uh, human beings are acting collectively and not something else. And uh, secondly, we have to take into account the double character of social processes, of uh, the impact on the social and economic uh, system, also on cultural and uh, political uh, processes, as well as the impact on nature. And therefore, it is necessary not only to speak about the capitalist social formation. This is a very well-known uh, formula, which is uh, uh, no, which, which, which is widespread and well accepted. Uh, but perhaps it is necessary to speak about uh, today of the ca capitalocene, because it also uh, the geological formation influenced uh, by human activities uh, today and therefore capitalocene is integrating the aspect of the social formation of capitalism on the one hand and of the ecological consequences of human development under capitalism and that is uh, taken uh, that is uh, accepted by the term capitalocene. The already mentioned Jason Moore also uses this term capitalocene. Well, uh, the second A of the triple A, very briefly, um, is alternatives. Uh, in the capitalocene, alternatives also have a planetary uh, reach. This is the first that we have to uh, be aware of. And there are big alternatives uh, run by big political powers. Of course, the United States of America, by big corporations uh, like the Bill Gates Corporation, Microsoft and Google and so on. Uh, they are in the meanwhile uh, exerting uh, alternatives on a planetary uh, scale. Uh, and they are targeting all Earth's systems, the system of information, the system of the economy, the energy system, the system of uh, mining raw materials and so on, the climate system, the genetic uh, pools of uh, uh, de life development, development of life, evolution of life and so on. And this shows you uh, that the problem which you can read in the newspapers today and tomorrow about NSA uh, in, that is information, global information system and uh, on the one hand and uh, uh, climate change on the other and the economic world crisis on the third uh, hand that they have to do with each other. They are not to be discussed, debated in different disciplines or different discourses, they have to do with each other. Because information is necessary for the economy as well as for uh, ecology and uh, uh, dealing with nature and so on. And therefore, they are belonging together. 
that is uh, very, very important uh, for alternative practice. And therefore, we have to be aware that the world is on the cross at the crossroads. On the one hand, uh, the natural crisis, ecological issues, and they are dealt with uh, by means of geoengineering. There, are in the last years, uh, have been published many, many books on geoengineering, not by accident. And geoengineering always means that you deal with these problems on a planetary. Uh, geological uh, basis and, 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 and level. And uh, yeah, by, for instance, radiation management, uh, make the sun um, a factor which is not heating the planet anymore, make it dark. That is, uh, shut the planet Earth vis-a-vis -vis the rays of the sun even more than it has been done by the transformation uh, to the fossil energy instead of solar energy. Continue with that what has been begun in uh, the 18th uh, century, but make it more radical and more efficiently, technologically, and that is what geoengineers tell you. You can read, when you go into the internet, a lot of uh, papers and, and articles with uh, this uh, intention and uh, this message. Well, I will not speak more about it, not on carbon dioxide removal and so on. There are many, many other problems uh, which we uh, could deal with. Uh, but only uh, tell about uh, the alternative, and uh, that is a moral economy, a solidarity economy in a very uh, narrow uh, space on the local and so on and so uh, forth. That could be an alternative, which is an alternative uh, which is already present in uh, the development uh, of our of our uh, days. There is on the one hand uh, the history of capitalist growth, which I already spoke about it, uh, but there is also uh, the history of morale, of communalism, reciprocity, uh, solidarity of an alternative uh, economy. And there are many initiatives uh, in the world which follow this alternative uh, line. And that is uh, where activism, the, tri the third uh, A of the triple A, is um, emerging and uh, becomes uh, important uh, for the further uh, debates. Uh, there are many examples of uh, this uh, development, the reappropriation of uh, public spaces and of the commons on a local or the regional, national and uh, global level. There are examples from Latin America, uh, for instance, uh, or also from Europe about uh, these uh, developments, which I only mention here and go not into detail in order to, uh, to, to describe it. In order to con conclude, there is a great challenge to develop a new culture of uh, cooperation between new social movement and uh, movements and traditional ones, uh, for instance, uh, trade unions, about which I did not speak until now, but they are important as actors. When we speak about actors, and we cannot f forget them. Uh, we have also to bring different strengths of uh, thinking in social sciences uh, together in order to better approach the millennial economic, social and ecological uh, challenges. And we have uh, to overcome the divide uh, between the hard sciences, the natural sciences, and the soft, uh, so-called soft uh, social uh, sciences, because this division is no more viable in the capitalocene. When we are speaking about the double character and about energy transformation and, uh, and transformation of matter 
and uh, the emissions and the inputs of this transformation, then of course we have to take also natural science uh, as social scientists into uh, account as well as natural scientists have to take social science uh, uh, results into account, into their uh, discourses. Uh, when we want to understand the capitalist scene and to build alternatives, uh, we cannot uh, work in a different uh, way. We have to understand the world as a, that is the word of uh, Friedrich Engels uh, in his uh, book on the dialectics of uh, nature as a dialectical totality and we have to deal with all the ingredients of uh, this totality. That is uh, what I wanted to tell you about uh, the politicizing uh, ecology and uh, in order to, to, to end I say that the last, what I said about the dialectics uh, or the di dialectical totality you find in uh, the um, work that is uh, uh, of Friedrich Engels about the dialectics of nature and it is good to mention it because this book uh, has been published exactly uh, 90 years uh, ago so it has an anniversary and uh, this is uh, the reason why we perhaps have a look into uh, such a book which tries to combine uh, the natural sciences and uh, the social sciences in a dialectical way. Thanks a lot for your attention and we have time to discuss. Yeah? Thank you very much for this lecture. It seems like uh, we should not be leaving the three A's to the hard sciences, to geoengineers and so on, especially the three A's in the age of the Anthropocene. Um, thank you very much for this lecture. Um, we, we're now going to go to a Q&A. It seems to me that the alternatives that you were pointing at, that is solidarity-based, model-based, local the community forms of organization. They have been, as you rightly pointed out, have been of all times. They have paralleled capitalism um, all, all, all the time. Uh, do they therefore, given the historical rec record, are not very effective at, at counterbalancing, let alone overcoming the formidable forces of the capitalist scene that you described. So is the alternative that you're suggesting not a bit thin, given the extraordinary challenges that you so eloquently described? And then secondly, quickly, although in the title of your talk you mentioned politicization, but I did not find politicization in the description of your alternatives. So we'd like to push you a bit more on this field of alternatives and to ask whether we can move beyond these localized solidarity-based community forms of organization, however important they are. Uh, thanks a lot for the uh, uh, comment. It was not a question, but a, a comment. And I agree uh, with many of your ideas you, ma you mentioned. Uh, there was always in history a, a parallel history of uh, profit making, simply said, and uh, a moral dimension. That is what uh, E.P. Thompson already in his, uh, in his uh, paper on the moral economy uh, was nearly more than 20 years ago already uh, wrote and uh, which is important also in the writings of, of Marx and Engels. Uh, they also were aware of uh, this uh, moral side of uh, the development of capitalism. Today we have still the same parallelity between on the one hand uh, profit making, accumulation and growth and on the other side uh, solidarity and so on and so forth. In other parts of the world perhaps more outspoken than in Europe uh, that depends from country to country and not only from country to country but from cultures in these countries to cultures in uh, other countries. But on the other hand 
uh, we have to be aware that in the world today uh, we have m many of these alternatives. Um, two years ago, no, three years ago, there was a year of uh, the cooperation declared by the United Nations. And uh, in the run of uh, this year of the corporations, there were also, uh, also uh, some numbers about the development of uh, cooperation, cooper cooperatives, not corporation, cooperatives, excuse me, I apologize. Uh, the numbers of cooperatives and uh, Ban Ki-moon, the secretary of the United States said, that is uh, 700 million people in the world working in cooperatives, in energy co cooperatives. There's a, a boom of, uh, of uh, founding energy cooperatives, of uh, alternative energies uh, in Germany, for instance, and in other uh, European countries, it is not so different. But in the world, in, in, uh, in some, there are 700 million uh, people working in cooperatives, energy cooperatives, as I said, but production cooperatives, housing cooperatives, uh, land cooperatives, and so on and so forth. There are many uh, of these forms. And that means uh, that when you uh, multiply 700 with three as members of families, that two billion, uh, more or less two billion men and women are working under different conditions uh, than the normal capitalist ones. That is sometimes not the best way of uh, building alternatives because some of these uh, cooperatives are, uh, are full of precarious uh, work and, and, and so on. Uh, that is not only a friendly perspective. Uh, we have to, to add, we have to be realistic. But it is an alternative, especially in times of a crisis of the profit system, as we are experiencing it uh, today uh, in Greece or in uh, Portugal. Uh, and uh, 10 years ago in, in Argentina, uh, for instance, uh, then there is a boom of uh, solidarity economy, of cooperatives mostly. And uh, in, in Argentina, 2001, mm -hmm. in the big crisis, uh, there was a boom of uh, the foundation of, of, of cooperatives as children of emergency. There was no way out. Those who are following the profit principle uh, are shutting, closing uh, the shops and, uh, and, uh, and uh, sh throwing workers out uh, of the shop. And what shall they do? They have no alternative as to make their own uh, organization, their own uh, shop, and that is uh, in forms of uh, cooperatives or in other forms. I was in Argentina in those times, and, uh, around the 2000-2001, in this big crisis. And, and there were many indigenous uh, persons uh, from the Mapuche, uh, for instance, uh, they uh, remembered their old forms of, uh, of, of cooperative work. That is not the cooperative as we know it here in Europe or in Latin America in a formal sense. It is different and uh, the principles are different with which they organize uh, the alternative. That means there is the alternative, but we are in the, in the, the trap which you mentioned on the global level, and when it must be global, uh, there the big firms, the big corporations, the big states, the big governments and so are predominant, are ruling. And uh, it is very hard uh, to find a way uh, to uh, build alternatives against this power. It's a power structure which also is uh, present in the world today. And it's very hard to overcome it. I, uh, to some extent, you already started to, be, to detail a little bit your, your ideas, your vision of, of specific kinds of cooperatives in this case um, that, that you would consider an alternative. Um, I would be interested to find out a bit more about your idea of the moral economy. Um, so what, what would be the role of the state in such a moral economy? What's, what, what is to do with property rights in such a moral economy and, and 
how about uh, the, inter the system of international institutions? How do we have to imagine that? And in a sense, you, 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 uh, you said quite rightly that Google, Facebook, these have a global reach and that can be portrayed as a force of change and it is changing things, um, but I guess they may not be organized in the way that we want them to be organized. So, um, so what, how, do, how would these need to be organized to be, to be uh, part of a moral economy in a, in a, a productive way? Thanks. Yeah, the, <clears throat> we are of course in a, in a, in a, in a um, stalemate because on the one hand we are dealing with global problems but we have no global actors. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have uh, very powerful actors uh, on the state level, national state, we have international organizations also. Uh, we have uh, on the global level only big NGOs, which are part of the power structure of what has been called, or what is called uh, the governance structure uh, of the world. And there is a big debate on uh, the question whether this uh, governance structure uh, can be overcome uh, by a world uh, civil society uh, uh, or the global civil society uh, movement. That is the idea of uh, the scientific uh, council of uh, in ecological uh, questions of the German government, for instance. But it is uh, not. Uh, possible uh, to have uh, alternatives uh, on a global scale and get actors on a global scale which are following a non-big uh, energy alternative or production or also consumption alternative uh, that must be done on the local or on smaller scale otherwise I think it is impossible and we have to develop some new forms of, of networking in order to bring these uh, local um, initiatives uh, together uh, to form a global power structure out of it. And of course you need uh, some programmatic ideas for that. Uh, for that we need theory and uh, a theory which is able to understand the ecological as well as the economic and uh, social and, and cultural uh, uh, dimensions of uh, such an initiative. Um, and uh, we have to work about it. I think nobody has, uh, has a, a, a solution for this problem. But uh, we must be able to formulate uh, the questions and uh, find then in a common, uh, in a common uh, uh, achievement answers on these questions we are posing. That is what I can uh, say at the moment about, about this question. And on a, on, a, on a national level there is a lot of ideas and many, many groups working on alternative, uh, for instance, alternative economics, uh, alternative uh, uh, environmental issues. There's uh, so much uh, that we, uh, there's plenty of, uh, of ideas of this kind, uh, but it is always uh, to the question or the problem or the difficulty to bring all these ideas to the ground. Uh, where actors are trying to change the situation. And uh, that has to be done uh, immediately and, uh, and uh, always uh, near to the problem exposed. And therefore, general ideas, um, sometimes much more useful uh, than concrete uh, uh, programs, which uh, show that they are not concrete enough in case that they have to be realized. That is a, but that's a general problem, not only today and for us, but for everybody who is trying to formulate 
uh, alternative ideas and to bring them into reality. The great transformation period was, fo was followed also by the great colonialism. So what's the, the role that you put on colonialism? And, and, s and so the possibilities of new way, new, new other alternatives to the colonial alternatives and also the role of the state on the, the example that you gave on the Mapuches, I think also plays with this uh, against not only the, the economic uh, concentration, accumulation, but also as a freedom of other, other possibility of existence. Usually we tend to think that all these movements are local and capital would be global. And then we, we can realize, I'm coming from uh, South America, then the majority are local and the minority there would be capital. Uh, I would see lots of uh, uh, poor people, the, the impur impoverished people and indigenous group which are almost the majority of the world in somehow. I don't know if that's local or global struggle. I'm very confused with these two concepts. I, I don't, I'm not sure that I understood everything what you, what you said. Uh, but um, the uh, colonial system, of course, came up also uh, with uh, at the end or, or at the beginning of, of capitalism. Um, and uh, in the f 15th century, uh, the world systems theory uh, says that the capitalist system had a political uh, origin and that was uh, the uh, peace treaty of uh, Esna, uh, after the, after the 30 years war in Europe, 1648, and an economic uh, origin uh, that was uh, the discovery of uh, the Americas by Columbus uh, 1492. And between 1492 and uh, 1548, 150 years or so, uh, that is in the words of, uh, of uh, Fernand Baudel, uh, the long 16th century. That was a decisive uh, uh, epoch of uh, the development of uh, the capitalist world system and this world system existed or consisted uh, above all uh, out uh, from colonies. And therefore colonialism is one of the main um, factors of capitalist development and that is well known and well analyzed uh, because colonialism was a basis of uh, primitive accumulation. Uh, it uh, was the basis of the riches in the European colonial uh, powers. It was the reason of uh, the, the, uh, the, the growth and the emergence of Great Britain as a, as a, as a superpower. Uh, and uh, with the silver from the colonies in Latin America and so on, uh, the capitalist accumulation has been powered. And, uh, the, the, and David Ricardo, whom I already uh, quoted, was well aware uh, in his famous example between the exchange between Portugal and England. Uh, th that was an exchange between these two countries, but on the base of, basis of the silver, which has been imported from the Latin American uh, colonies, uh, the Portuguese and Spanish uh, colonies. So uh, we have to be aware that this uh, world systemic approach is a necessary approach in order to understand the long-term development of modern uh, capitalism, and that is not wrong today. We have uh, still to take into account uh, how the different uh, uh, minerals, the different uh, energetic uh, sources work together and, uh, and make up uh, what is uh, modern uh, capitalism and which is the reason of its uh, dynamics. Uh, that is what with regard to colonialism, but there was also another aspect in your uh, in your question, which I have not in my mind at the moment. Perhaps you can repeat it, if possible. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the possibility to think alternatives in the, in the colonial times, because you, you were mentioning the, the, the colonialism on America, but actually uh, the, in the 19th century, here in Berlin, the world was redivided. 
in 1885, which was following the second industrial revolution and increasing the acceleration is. But my, my question is more on thinking alternatives because the Mapuche example for, that, that you gave is also being repressed by other forms of coloniality, I would say, Lula in Brazil. So how, how, how could this, how, how, how could we imagine new other possibilities to, to, to move out of capitalism and now so of uh, colonialism. Well, no, it is, uh, it is not, uh, not simply possible to move out of capitalism uh, because uh, capitalism is, uh, is uh, not a building where you can move out and then the building is, uh, is empty and uh, perhaps it breaks down because there is nobody anymore. Uh, so it is not. You have to build another building in the old building. Uh, that is uh, the question. That is, uh, you have to to renovate. Uh, so capitalism, so long as it uh, exists as a social dominant social formation, and then build it in such a way that perhaps the building uh, becomes another, another one, a better one, a nicer one, a more comfortable uh, one. Uh, which we then uh, no more call capitalism, house of capitalism, but house of uh, somewhat else, of a solar society, of solidarity uh, society, uh, of socialism uh, maybe, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, this is a big problem which is very actual today. I remember what uh, the Greek finance minister Varoufakis uh, said or, or wrote. He, he said or, or wrote, uh, that uh, we first have to uh, save capitalism in order to avoid uh, the problems which are break down of capitalism or of certain parts of the capitalist development that is uh, the debt crisis of uh, European uh, capitalism because it has so many uh, tragical and 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, and negative effects on people that we have to avoid this kind of, uh, of collapse of capitalism and therefore we have to save it. We have to save it in order to have the time uh, to build something better new. And uh, that is all, uh, still the, a dilemma which already existed uh, all over the century, uh, but uh, people or parties or intellectuals were not so aware of these difficulties as we are as we are it, uh, today. Thank you. I think my question is related to what you just said about building a new building from inside. I think I liked a lot. The microphone is on. Yes. Okay. <laughs> just referring to what you just said and your last slide when you push for the need to develop strategic concepts. I like that. I think I like that idea. I wonder if this concept of uh, capitalocene is one of those strategic concepts. Uh, otherwise, could you maybe give an example or further develop this idea of strategic concepts? In my opinion, you know, the capitalocene is not an alternative. It is a continuation of capitalist uh, development uh, because of the double character of uh, capitalism, uh, because it uh, in uh, modern times um, is not only creating a social uh, world system, the capitalist world system, not as a social and economic one alone, but also affecting uh, the spheres, the ecological spheres of uh, planet Earth. And uh, some of the data I showed you, uh, the, the effect on the climate system, the effect on, on the, the ex exploitation of uh, energy sources of fossil energy and so on and so forth. These are all of them uh, effects of uh, the uh, capitalist, of the dynamics of the capitalist mode uh, of production. And so far, the capitalocene is not an alternative. We have to find alternatives to the capitalocene. And that is in, in so far very important as it, uh, it, uh, it, it shows that we have not only to find alternatives to the capitalist social formation, but also alternatives to the effects of the social formation on the earth systems, 
on the geological uh, and other Earth systems, inclusive the information uh, system. And NSA and the scandal around it makes it clear that there are connections uh, in this uh, dialectic totality of uh, capitalist formation, social formation, geological formation, uh, and uh, ecolo well, I said already, ecological formation. Uh, that is what we have to be aware of. And uh, then the next step, we can uh, try to build uh, or to, 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 to conceptualize uh, utopian, of course, uh, alternatives to this capital scene. And in my opinion, these alternatives must be small, not, not too small, must be networks, uh, very lively networks, uh, must be based on uh, alternative energy, that, that is renewable energy, that is the energy flow of the sun, of the rays of the sun, and not the stocks of fossil energy in the crust of the earth. And then we have also to take into account uh, the consequences for our social formation. And uh, since there was always uh, the parallelity, we spoke about that, of uh, profit-making capitalism on the one hand, on the other hand, solidarity, uh, morality. Uh, so we have to build it more on solidarity and <coughs> on morale in order to find an alternative in difference uh, to, the, uh, to the predominant uh, capitalist uh, uh, trajectory. Hi, <clears throat> you talked about uh, a little bit about global uh, global govern. You mentioned global governance and the possibility of global civil society rising up to a more prominent position or more prominent um, role. Let's say. I'd like to know a little bit about uh, how do you see the possibility, or do you see the possibility of the existing? Do you see the possibility of the existing global governance institution, basically the UN system, United Nations system, playing any relevant role in this future or upcoming? scenario at all, or do you think they are ill-equipped Ill to do that? I would like to see the, uh, some possibilities, some, some hope and uh, some uh, positive perspectives, but uh, I am uh, rather pessimistic with regard uh, to the uh, today dominating governance uh, structures. They have not uh, brought what they should bring, together they, uh, they are no alternatives. The, the, the scientific council of the, of, of in Germany, of uh, the, the, the uh, scientific council, Wissenschaftliche Beirat globale Umwelt, global environmental policy, so it's called, uh, has not brought uh, convincing uh, proposals uh, for this uh, issue. Why? I think, first of all, uh, and that has to do with the subject of this lecture, this triple A. First of all, I think, because I have a very poor uh, analytical approach. They are not critical enough. Uh, I think it is impossible today to, to uh, approach ecological issues as economic and social issues as well, without taking the Marxian uh, approach of the double character into account. And they don't do that. They explicitly deny it, uh, because Marxism, that is uh, from yesterday or, or the day before yesterday and so on, it has nothing to do uh, with our uh, uh, real and, uh, and, and problems uh, which are so burning. Well, that is the first uh, which we have to take into account. We must be more open-minded in our analytical approaches in order to uh, develop alternatives. And secondly, the WGU, the Scientific Council, uh, has a very optimistic and uh, perhaps uh, even naive uh, understanding of uh, social movements, of social actors. 
because these social movements and social actors, of course, are living in a very contradictory environment. Why should they not be very contradictory and conflict prone? And they are. And uh, they must be prepared uh, for the upcoming uh, conflicts. And uh, some of them do that and others do not. And uh, the Scientific Council uh, says uh, there are no conflicts, a little bit uh, uh, exaggerated. There are no conflicts or we can uh, resolve these conflicts within the framework of our uh, political understanding of, uh, in Germany and in Europe and perhaps also in the, in the world. That is what uh, makes a problem. We must to take into account that there are conflicts, that there are contradictions, that there are different actors with different uh, interests and uh, that they must uh, come together and not always they come together. Uh, they, <laughs> they separate sometimes and we have to find uh, uh, projects and projections, utopian projections mostly, uh, which can bring them together. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could say a few words about your experience working with uh, ATTAC as, as an academic advisor, because most of us here are PhD students and we've been discussing for, for a while now about <coughs> how to put our academic knowledge to use in, uh, in, in engaged ways. Thank you. Uh, may, I, may I pose a question? In which country, from which country do you come? Uh, Italy. What? Italy. Italy, okay. Okay, in Italy you have also attack. And uh, it, I've, I'm uh, not 100% not familiar with the attack in Italy, uh, but, uh, but they have also, I don't know, the scientific council. And the scientific council, uh, you know, uh, that is nothing um, special. Uh, it is an important body, of course, uh, when you are a member of such a body, it is important for you, but whether it is important for attack or for society or for Europe, that is a question uh, which I cannot answer. Uh, what we are doing, I can tell you. Um, first, uh, it is uh, education. Uh, attack organizes uh, summer academies about the uh, issues of concern in uh, the world of today, uh, that is peace and war in Europe, that is the integration process a project in Europe, uh, that is uh, the state of the environment, uh, that is uh, uh, the development issue and the growth issue linked to it, related to it, and so on and so forth. And there are uh, debates about it, and that is, uh, in the best sense, alphabetization, as um, Pierre Bourdieu called it, alphabetization of uh, social movements. And uh, as a scientific council, or as a member of the scientific council, uh, I try uh, to, to promote this project of alphabetization, of ecological and economic alphabetization, in order uh, to, be in, uh, to, to be able uh, to uh, formulate alternatives to that what the government and uh, other actors are promoting and proposing. That is mostly what we are doing. Uh, and uh, first, on a national level, the, the once a year, uh, one week, uh, summer academy, then twice, uh, all, uh, all the second, year, all twice, uh, all, all second year, an uh, summer academy on a European level in order to, to meet uh, attack people and others from other European countries in order to organize some exchange on a European level, what is a big problem because of uh, the different languages we are all speaking and not everybody from Italy or, or from France or from Germany speaks English, that is a lingua franca uh, in attack on the European level. So you have a lot of problems and we have not the, 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 uh, the means uh, which uh, the formal institutions have to organize 
um, efficient and good translation of different languages. Well, and uh, then uh, ATTAC organizes these kind of meeting, alphabetization, but also is engaged in campaigns. Campaigns of Blockupy, for instance, ATTAC is a member of, of Blockupy movement, uh, is, is uh, active in uh, the campaign against uh, the uh, uh, debt crisis now in Greece and in other European uh, countries in order to find a solution and in order to also protect the people against the Troika, against uh, the creditors and so on and so forth. There are a lot of many other examples which I could tell you, but perhaps this is uh, first enough. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really liked your um, your lecture, and um, I have uh, um, two or three questions. The first, um, you talked about angles uh, and the dialectics of uh, nature. I don't know. I'm not that familiar with the work of angles, but the idea that I have is that angles was was not uh, properly um, environmentalist. Um, f and uh, in reality, there, the, between Engels and uh, Marx, Engels was seen as more uh, with a posi positivist uh, um, and favoring pro uh, the progressive uh, forces of production and so on. So I would like to ask if um, is there any other author, maybe more uh, contemporaneous, that uh, could, uh, uh, let's say, be a good reference in uh, approaching the dialectics between uh, nature and uh, society. And um, secondly, um, uh, when you, you talk about the alternatives and the importance of uh, building uh, moral economies, solidarity economies, of networking, uh, what I miss probably is also uh, engage, uh, to engage with something that was key for, uh, for Marx's uh, work that is related with the class uh, struggle and how to see this, um, in a, let's say, in a, uh, considering in, t in a general terms, if we consider capitalism as a sh social totality in contradiction, uh, seeing class struggle not only as the conflict in the workplace and between worker and the, the boss, but how to see this kind of uh, small local alternatives within uh, a broader context that is of, uh, of um, struggling the hegemony of the ruling uh, classes. And maybe you have been in Argentina, what happened in Argentina, all these solidarity economies uh, it, it is clear how they participated in a conflictual situation that probably we can uh, say it is class struggle, but we can look at Argentina now and also to see what happened. So should we also take lessons and um, let's say nowadays think a bit uh, more on how to, to make these connections between this kind of uh, alternatives and the more classic uh, movements and um, how, how to deal with it. And also, how, if there is, how do you, s you talked about uh, the importance of networking and going global. We had uh, already the anti-globalization movement that was very global and making these uh, kinds of networking. Uh, but also, um, this was a decli declined, uh, this movement. And uh, thinking of this, how do you see the role today of the states and the control that the states sti still have in terms of building consent, of coercion, and uh, how to articulate the local, the global, with the national level? Yes, uh, so we stay here until tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> until breakfast, yeah, <laughs> in order to, to resolve all these problems you, you mentioned. Yes, uh, but uh, first, Engels. Uh, I, I, four weeks ago or so, uh, I published a small book on the dialectics of nature of, of Engels in German, 
so not all of you can read it. Uh, and I read, of course, the Dialectics of Nature anew uh, and uh, several times anew. And I can tell you, in, in Engels you find very, very many ecological uh, aspects of uh, social scientists, sciences. He first of all uh, studied uh, natural science, sciences in order to understand better the industrial system. And Engels was it who said, uh, who invented all these things uh, going into natural sciences in Manchester, where he worked in a factory. Uh, and in the industrial system, which was uh, very present in Manchester, uh, where the industrialization had its origin, and Engels was uh, with it, he was there, one of the promoters of it, because he was a capitalist in those times. Uh, and um, therefore he, he knew very exactly that to understand the process of industrialization, you must study first political economy and criticize it. Therefore, critical critique of political economy. And that was the idea of Karl Marx. Uh, and Engels followed it. And secondly, you have to take into account all that uh, what is the material side of the production process, the production of, of uh, use values. And use values uh, are made from energy and matter. Uh, so you have to deal with uh, energy and matter and the transformation processes of energy and matter. That is with machinery and that means that you have to study technical uh, developments uh, technique and uh, sec technology. And secondly, it's made out of... Uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's also a, a process of transformation of, of, of energy. Uh, so you have to look into, the, into the, 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 the problems of transforming energy. Uh, what happens when you transform energy stored in coal, for instance, into electricity? That was one of the questions of Engels. Uh, what is done by this? That is a thermodynamic uh, question. And so he was uh, very uh, keen on these new developments in uh, technical and natural science uh, development. And uh, he was well, well aware, and I could give you uh, many citations, quotations, which prove it. He was well aware on the destructive side of uh, capitalist production processes, which are at the same time, and the productive forces, he said, are at the same time destructive forces. You can use the same machinery uh, for producing uh, con consumption goods, and for producing weapons, uh, for instance. And you are always uh, producing emissions uh, uh, in a solid, in a, in a, in a gasic uh, form, and so on and so forth. So he knew that. And uh, it is important to know and, and good to see uh, that uh, Karl Marx, who was also well aware of the, of the ecological problems, uh, always uh, asked his friend uh, Friedrich Engels when he met uh, some of uh, the problems of natural sciences uh, or of nature, uh, which he could not resolve. Uh, for instance, there's a very famous uh, exchange of, of letters between Engels and Marx on the so-called Podolinsky question. You know it. Oh, okay. Then I have not to repeat. The, and, and Paul Burkett and uh, and um, uh, um, another Paul Burkett and uh, and um, Bell Bellamy Foster. <laughs> uh, I apologize. Uh, they wrote a book about uh, a long article about the uh, Podolinsky question about the ecological angles and and Marx. And uh, those who did not read it, uh, that is not you. They should do that because it is very important. A question for the understanding of uh, Marxist uh, approach to the ecological uh, question. The second, uh, the alternatives. Um, 
of course, these alternatives uh, are developed in traditional uh, organizations, parties as well as uh, trade unions. And that was the discourse of the 70s, perhaps also uh, the 50s and 60s of the, of the last century. And only in the new century, the ecological question becomes part of uh, the alternative, uh, dis dis uh, of the, part of the discourse on alternatives. <laughs> Uh, in Germany, we have uh, the so-called Memorandum Group, perhaps you know it. Uh, they publish uh, an annual memorandum for an alternative economic policy. And uh, also on a European level, uh, there exists now since five years or so, a uh, uh, Euro Memorandum uh, with proposals for an alternative economic policy, very co concrete. Uh, proposals concerning fiscal policy, labor market policy, uh, monetary policy, uh, foreign policy, uh, and so on and so forth, and also environmental policy. That is always a chapter in this Euro memorandum. In so far, also in traditional organizations, in the traditional approaches, academic approaches, there is a new interest and uh, new uh, attention on uh, these ecological uh, questions. But they have to be brought together with the other uh, alternative dialogues and, uh, and, and, uh, and um, discourses uh, coming from alternative movements, which do not belong to the traditional organizations, such as environmental groups, women's uh, groups, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and ad hoc groups, uh, for instance, in, in the context of uh, the contemporary uh, Greek uh, crisis. And uh, we have to bring them together. And uh, that can only be done either on a personal uh, level, that is, one meets another, or on you know, organized uh, form in uh, meetings which uh, combine the different strands of uh, thinking and uh, experiences. And uh, that is also done in many, many countries and uh, over the borders of the countries also, be beyond the borders. Okay, thank you very much for this lecture. Uh, thank you for your questions um, and have a good evening. And for the answers. Yeah, and the answers. <laughs>